In my class, we read this article called Escape the Echo Chamber. Um, in, the art in the article, the author addresses two different phenomena that cut off the flow of information in two distinct ways. Um, the first is called an epistemic bubble. It's basically like an informational network where people form circles that either intentionally or unintentionally exclude outside in information, outside voices. Um, so let's talk about that. Uh, epistemic, epistemic bubbles can be popped by just exposing the outside sources to the group and diversifying the pool of information. Mm -hmm. um, many times we see epistemic bubbles manifest in harmless ways such as Facebook groups, making a space for certain causes uh, for people with similar interests or professions. Mm -hmm. um, the author describes epistemic bubbles by saying, when we take networks and platforms used for social media purposes and begin using them as informational feeds, we tend to miss out on contrary views and run into exaggerated degrees of agreement. Have you ever have you ever seen anything on social media platforms that was pushing a certain agenda with with biased information? Me skincare wash, um, anything exaggerated. Maybe it was about politics or conspiracy theory about a new celebrity couple. Mm -hmm. um, um, I have seen it with politics, not really on my social media, but I know my parents are very active in that stuff, like Facebook. I know my dad has a Twitter that you could consider an epistemic bubble because it's like he only wants to talk to other people who are willing to talk about politics and it's kind of like a political banter type thing. Um, when I was in high school, I still had a Facebook account and I I don't know how Facebook or like the algorithm or really just like the friends that I made, but a lot of my friend group was really liberal and my Facebook feed definitely reflected that mm. and so like it would always be like oh like pro Hillary like I didn't see anything about Trump do you think epistemic bubbles are for the most part harmless or do you think they're very problematic I mean if all it takes if you think about it all it takes is for a contrary voice to enter a bubble to pop that epistemic bubble right so thinking about all these people arguing nowadays do you think it is that harmless or, or do you think it, do you think it's not problematic, or do you think it's uh, maybe it it's problematic for what it's what the epistemic bubble is being uh, is about? Because if you're talking about politics and you're only one sided, and um, people might think either or. So, what is what is your take on that? Um, I think that they could be really problematic for a lot of reasons. Um, Most epistemic bubbles are harmful, um, depending on like what kind of epistemic bubble they are. If the information that's being shared is one-sided, it's not inclusive, um, biased, and stay oblivious to outside information, or if it's just dangerous or bad information or false information, and that's the same thing that's being repeated over and over again, that can end up with a really toxic situation. Um, Some of the more harmful ones that, like, political things, like certain news channels, that's a bubble that needs to be popped. Mm -hmm. Or does it basically depend on what the epistemic bubble is about? You mentioned like sometimes like Facebook chat rooms. I think those are like completely harmless when people are discussing what restaurants to eat at. Like an app could be a, considered an epistemic bubble like Yelp. Only their users have access to like reviews on certain restaurants and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. If it's something like a Facebook group full of moms with parenting trips, then that would be like mm -hmm. something that's fine, that's positive. Okay, next question. Have you ever been in a situation where a whole group of people thinks one way about something and you don't really know if you feel the same or if you think differently? Do you typically just take their word for it because they're your friends and you're going to take their testimony maybe sometimes, maybe uh, just because they said so? Um, or do you like to find your own opinions about things and kind of take an unbiased approach when dealing with situations like this? So... I can think of an example of this that's happened to me a couple of times. Okay. Um, in relation to movies, I mm, that's a good example. I like action movies and I like kids movies and <laughs> <laughs> that's like it. Me. Oh my god, <laughs> like, that's all. And Game of Thrones. And, and Game of Thrones. <laughs> um, I think. Shout out, Professor Basu. She's a huge Game of Thrones fan. I'm a professor. Anyway. Um, 
and a lot of times like my friends will want to go to the movies and they'll see they'll want to see a particular thing and it's never what I want to see if all my friends are a part of one political party I'm not just gonna kind of formulate with their views that's something that constantly happens at my school and like even with my parents and stuff like that just because their views are their views I try to stay like unbiased and not join in their epistemic bubbles and like find out information on my own mm. If you don't latch on to information given by others, like you said that you don't, mm -hmm. um, how do you go about trying to find out for yourself if something or someone uh, or a movie, for instance, mm -hmm. if someone tries to spoil a movie and or convince you not to go because all your friends think it's lame and you're in a group chat and they're like, no, I heard it's lame, let's not go. Mm -hmm. And you're like, wait a minute, I want to go. How do you go about finding contrary information or at least experiencing it for yourself to mm -hmm. figure out what your views are rather than just latching on with what you've heard mm -hmm. um let's start with that question okay so going back to the queen and slim example um, what is, i'm sorry what is queen and slim about queen and slim <laughs> is a movie and i didn't want to see it because i was like i don't know how this is going to end and it's seven o'clock at night i don't i don't want to end the capacity <laughs> for this <laughs> So, but also on the internet after that, um, I saw a lot of different reactions to the movie and on just on Twitter. And so I looked on Twitter and I like searched it to like see what people were saying. But then I also Googled it and I read articles. I talked to my mom. I had, I made my mom go see it, see what she would say. And then I also, I started reading the script for myself so that I could, without having to actually watch it, still figure out what happened and how I personally felt about it. So oh. I like to go and look in a different, and like a variety of places. To find, your, to find out information. Exactly. Um, if there's like a situation where there's someone that, like what you said, that if there's someone that I don't know that everyone else knows and they're talking about how that person's rude or they're fake or something like that, I don't consider that my own opinion. I make my own. There's plenty of people that my friends hate or absolutely despise that I continue to be friends with because I haven't experienced that with them. Trying not to do the aha moment where it's like, oh, my friends warned me about you being a little weird. You give me one reason to think, you give me one reason to think that you're weird and I take it. How do you avoid that type of uh, mentality? If there's someone that they think is weird or something like that and like that person does something weird towards me, whether it's like kind of like a sneaky friend thing or they just ask me like a weird question, I'll just kind of make a mental note of it myself, but I don't go back and say to my friend like, oh, you're right, this person is was weird. And I don't say that like in general, I just mm -hmm. kind of like let the situation be or die out as it is. Uh, what would you say are the social consequences that some people may experience when they, when they want to acknowledge a contrary views from the rest of a group? Um, well, I have like personal experience with this with, or at my school anyway, but, like my school is a very politically active school on both sides of the like political party scale and um, some of my previous friend groups have been more right wing and when I did hang out with them I had different views from them. With BSU over Thanksgiving break everybody wanted to go see Queen and Slim and I was like I'm gonna go watch Frozen 2 and I <laughs> felt okay with that decision. I was really happy with my decision. <laughs> to go against the To, to go, go against, against the grain, mm -hmm. yeah and it wasn't that I was like completely excluded it was just like arguments would happen and stuff like that and then friends that I had that were the complete opposite and were completely left-wing um, I kind of experienced the same thing with them but um, there have definitely been times in my friend group where I've noticed that either me or someone else has had a different opinion and if it if they did speak up, it was either like outside of the group in like a one-on-one -on -one situation, mm. or if it was with the larger group, then it was most likely shot down by the bigger group or like ignored and like brushed aside. Um, and like in extreme cases, like the person might be laughed at or like talked about for having that differing opinion. Consequences that people could face who are like deeply involved in those epistemic um, bubbles are just like isolation and in friend terms like mm -hmm. not being invited to stuff not no, not stuff being like invited that. to parties um, and hang out and things like that can happen but at the same time like it all depends on like 
who you're friends with because if someone's like a real friend they're not going to just exclude you based on your opinions and like, that's what I believe anyway. And now it's like 14 people and I always and still am the only like non-straight person in my friend group and like they're my best friends most of them but like some of them just don't get it which is kind of frustrating because when you're dealing in a friend group obviously you want everyone to feel close to you and like you want to feel seen by them um and there's this one particular friend that i had um who actually goes to one of the five c schools now which is funny um who like always like made some just like less than appropriate jokes about all sorts of things and he's like one of the kind of like white straight men who's like who like thinks that having like a off color sense of humor is like a personality trait and like makes offensive jokes and thinks that they're hilarious. And so at one point in our group chat, he just made his like 1,000th like gay joke. And I was just like, I don't know why. I was maybe in a mood that day, but I was like, that's not okay. And I called him out in the group chat and no one else said anything. Mm. Like no one backed me up. Mm. And that was definitely a juncture um, for my relationship to that group. To him, obviously, but also to that whole friend group of like 12 to 14 people. Um, because literally no one stuck up for me. Which was unfortunate, but I think it illustrates really well um, the concepts that you're discussing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was tough, but I think that I, obviously I wouldn't have called him out if I wasn't ready to deal with the consequences of that. Which is also unfortunate because they shouldn't be my consequences, but they yeah. were, and I was ready to deal with that. I'm not going to be friends with someone if they're going to treat me like that. He gave me a really half-assed apology that wasn't a real apology. Um, and so, I mean, I wasn't like, hey man, screw you. I was just like, okay. And then I distanced myself. Mm -hmm. okay. I wish I had a happier example, <laughs> but I feel it's like okay. that illustrates it pretty well. well thank rich because her dad invented toaster strudel. She really knows everybody's business. She knows everything about everyone. That's why her hair is so big. It's oh, a secret. Hey, hey, um, what's happening? And evil takes a human form in Regina George. Oh, I'll be cool. Because she may seem like your typical selfish, backstabbing, slut-faced oh, oh, my in God. In reality, she is so much more than that. She's the queen bee. The star. Those other two are just her little workers. Regina George. How do I even begin to explain Regina George? Regina George is flawless. She has two Fendi purses and a silver Lexus. I hear her hair is insured for $10,000. I hear she does car commercials in Japan. Her favorite Your opinion on this? Um, well, since I've seen the movie numerous times, I would know that, like, in the beginning, um, Katie wasn't a part of any epistemic bubbles because she had just moved, like, from Africa, I believe. Like, it was just... She just randomly showed up at the school. And when she did meet Janice and Damien, they were very keen on trying to convince her to hate the plastics like you said. Mm -hmm. So I think that could have put her in the position to automatically hate them. But since she was unbiased right away, she decided to formulate her own opinions about them. And like then um, a scene in the movie, like something happened at a party or something like that. And she did have that like aha moment. Like she hated the leader of the plastics or whatever, mm -hmm. so Regina she George. kind of had both of those, like, sides of it. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think that she's definitely, she enters an epistemic bubble in the movie because that, that part of the narrative is definitely set up such that she is overwhelmed by this widespread and widely held perception of Regina George that's mm -hmm. very pervasive at the school. And Katie... Well, Katie's the new kid, um, and she doesn't know what's happening, so she's really impressionable. She hasn't had time to form her own opinions, and she's just made these new friends who, like, she likes, it seems like. And I would say that she's probably just going to blindly believe, like, what they have to say about the plastics, rather than coming up with her own opinions of them. Mm. Like, yeah. Um, and I think that maybe the only people who would challenge that are Regina and her friends themselves mm. and that's kind of the idea is that like in the film you have this conflict between Katie's initial perception of Regina George and then when she becomes friends that's kind of challenged and that's one of the movie's conflicts is that she's torn between this reputation of Regina uh, that contradicts at first how Regina treats her which is very nicely she's very welcoming mm -hmm. um, wants to 
help Katie become more beautiful and more popular, which it seems nice and well-intentioned. Um, and then the, the conflict is further advanced through Regina being not so nice to Katie mm -hmm. um, once Katie kind of takes her position. So I think that that is actually a great example of when uh, an epistemic bubble is actually used as like a major plot point to mm -hmm. um, to build and drive like narrative conflict in a film. So she didn't feel under pressure to believe Janice and Damien until she saw for herself. It was not until mm -hmm. she begins hanging out with the plastics more seriously that she does pick up on the real mean girl qualities her friend Janice told her all about. Uh, this doesn't take away the fact that the epistemic bubble was present and continuing to grow around the knowledge spread about the plastics. Uh, we can see how the movie influences us to be part of an epistemic bubble as well. Um, how um, all these people, the movie starts off with all these random students speaking directly to the camera saying yeah one time regina did this to me or one time i saw regina do this and this and all these things are adding up to oh they the plastics are popular regina's the 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 queen bee at the school uh this this and that every and the third everyone is just wrapped up in this information but nothing is really said about them that like is like uh you know nothing is said to them or said about them that would pop the epistemic bubble um, going against any of the prior knowledge that was being talked about on their behalf. People from so many different groups and they all had the same thing to say about how like, like it seemed like everybody idolized her but she was still also like sort of violent but they were okay with it. Like when the world girl was like, she punched me in the face but it was awesome. Like, yeah, it seemed like they were trying to really convey to the audience this certain reputation. Where is she? She'll be here soon. Didn't travel with you? No. I didn't believe it until I saw them. I saw them all. How many? Hundred thousand at least. They knew that White Walkers had previously existed like in their world, but they thought that they were kind of like extinct or whatever mm -hmm. because they were stuck in an epistemic bubble thinking that um, the White Walkers had died off. Mm -hmm. So until they received outside information on their own, like until they physically experienced seeing the White Walkers and living through that, they didn't, like their epistemic bubble wasn't popped. Mm -hmm. So at that point, um, and at, at that point their opinion changed. Two things like informationally wise are brought to light, brought to Cersei's attention that up until that point, like I would, in the Game of Thrones universe, I'd imagine she would basically call fake news. You know, the dragons one and then the uh, ice zombies, the White Walkers two. 
uh, just because, yeah, I don't know. Like I can, I can feel like I can draw a pretty direct analogy between how her, like her reaction to uh, like before them coming, like before them, her seeing the dragons and the ice, ice zombies, like her just pretty much dismissing that as fake news, like because she was in an epistemic bubble of her own creation within like King's Landing, like she was trying to protect her own power. Same thing with Daenerys Targaryen and her dragons. Um, in the beginning of, of the show, like no one, everyone thought the same thing, that dragons were extinct and everything like that. Um, she did have like the three dragon eggs and she was on a completely different side of the planet or of their <laughs> world. So um, she didn't, like no one knew the real truth if she had dragons or not. Um, so I think that that could be considered an epistemic bubble. Um, she was in her own epistemic bubble. She didn't know what people thought about her or her family. She thought that some people were awaiting her arrival. And then on the other side of the planet, they despised her and her family. They thought that her dragons weren't real. They didn't think she was real. No one even knew, like stuff like that. So I think that that could be kind of like two epistemic bubbles that are like conflicting and both of them wouldn't be popped until they received outside information from each side. Like mm -hmm. until Daenerys showed herself and showed her dragons, the people who didn't believe she was real wouldn't ever know she was real. Um, so like, like as all the people in King's Landing are concerned, like, you know, White Walkers and, and dragons are a myth and so that's just like... yeah. By having that epistemic bubble, like she protects. Without that information, like her power is like largely secure. You know, she has no reason to ally with the North. She has no reason to like fear uh, Daenerys at all. So, just like creating that bubble for her, I don't know, retains status quo and like, um, you know, that epistemic bubble serves the same purpose it does in many of politics today, which is just like secures your own power to be like the only reason, the only correct, uh, or the only legitimate source of power, given the information you have. Mm -hmm. So given, you know, given that information, Cersei is like the only person who should be ruling mm -hmm. on King's Landing, like the right person to be ruling, but with the new information, once that you pop that bubble, like then you have to actually address the questions of, should we be fighting the North, should we like, you know, be fearful, of, should we like give up the, the throne to the dragons and Daenerys, like mm -hmm. those questions which before had an easy answer, mm -hmm. no, Cersei should be in charge. Now you actually have to address them. Yeah, and like fight for it, yeah. and like with all the power that Daenerys holds, it seems kind of unlikely that like Cersei uh, will still keep the throne when her dragons can like, you know, fire ring dragons can burn cities and burn um, regim like regimens and like, you know, hierarchies to the ground. So obviously that's like a, an immediate concern. Um, Echo chambers are a informational network that manipulates its group members and makes makes them hate the outside world and um, believe that they are the enemy. Uh, the group operates by implementing cult-like tactics to reinforce the strength of the group um, and even when someone tries to you know penetrate the group with some knowledge outside knowledge, uh, people that are heavily brainwashed by echo chambers tend to latch on even harder to the echo chamber rather than um, being able to let go of it and be free. So people that operate within echo chambers have this idea of vulnerability, like they need to trust something and they don't know who to trust. So basically people in echo chambers are really putting their trust in the wrong people and very untrustworthy people. And the people outside of, uh, out of echo chambers notice that and try to free them. Even with the facts laid right down in front of them, echo chamber members would not believe anything that goes against their leader. Or how you break an echo chamber, um, excuse me, you um, use an epistemic reboot to completely um, take yourself out of what you've always thought that you've known and you basically reboot and you start over and you do not judge anything, you don't have any biases, you completely start over from scratch, mentally trusting all sources, um, and then you have this idea of, you know, getting to regain all this knowledge that you've been cutting out of your life through being brought up this way or in, you know, just family members, religion. It's important to know that the power 
in an echo chamber is located in the minds of the brainwashed group members, who then reinforce the power of the leader. Given these facts, let's see what my interviewees have to say. Um, I think back to Spirit Week in high school. Um, I think a lot of public schools had that, but um, at my school it was a whole week before homecoming. Mm. And basically every day there's like a themed dress up day. Um, like there's a color day where all the grades have an individual color. Um, there's like a salad dressing day where like the freshmen are a healthy choice so they wear like sports where sophomores mm. are ranch dressing so they wear like cowboy stuff. Um, juniors mm. are Thousand Island so they wear like In Hawaiian Oklahoma. shirts. Oklahoma. Yeah. Um, seniors are Caesar, so they wear togas. Um, but the the funny thing about Spirit Week is that it was always such a primal mentality every single year, where there's a lot of class camaraderie that's built up, and part of that is through like Facebook groups. So each class, um, each graduating class has a Facebook group, and basically. I mean, every other time of the year, it's like you post about maybe homework or about some sort of event. It's pretty sporadic. But during Spirit Week, it's like every single day. Mm. Like you're learning chants for the lunch rallies. Um, you're like uh, reviewing the posters, like outfit inspiration. And a lot of it actually kind of unravels into trash talking the other grades. Like people would be like, oh, like I saw so-and-so from the sophomore class, like practicing before school. Like how lame is that that they're practicing? Like let's make up a chant about how they were practicing like oh. how was practice was like the the chant that we did so you basically were fighting so the grades were fighting amongst each other instead of building up an entire like let's lift the like the whole school up yeah it was like grade by grade and that's kind of the annual problem of spirit mm. week is that it creates these divides and i think that part of part of, a component of that is is this uh as you explained to me this echo chain of these grades having like ideas and knowledge and maybe observations of other grades. Basically within these class groups you have what is essentially an echo chamber that builds these sort of class rivalries that are at times like exciting and fun but also a little unhealthy because it, certain individuals from different grades were being attacked mm. for various things. I'm trying to think of an example. But more prominent individuals in certain grades, mm -hmm. more popular people you could say, were kind of subject to what I would consider bullying. It's kind of like, in a way, kind of like within these class divisions of Spirit Week, it kind of sounds like you're saying that there's kind of like cult culture kind of yeah. in a way. Where it, it's no, like, it, it is very it's a hierarchy. It's very, very culty. And it, it, it brings me, it, it reminds me of another aspect of Spirit Week where we would build like a float mm. uh, each class like that had to do with our theme. This is cool. I wish um, I went to this school. Yeah, it was it was fun, and and every every day I was super involved. I would be like at um, in like the auto shop, like working on the floats that were like they were like ten, twelve feet tall and like wide. Like people could stand on them, and they were all really really cool. And everyone, what high school did you go to? I went to Palo Alto High School. Mm. It's the Silicon Valley engineer in us. Mm -hmm. um, it so it was a great time, and everyone put so much effort into the floats. Like the more artistically inclined people would like paint murals in the back. And we had all these really cool, beautiful floats, and we would still individually trash talk the other grades' floats. Like I remember one year, the seniors didn't stuff their float with enough like tissue paper because they ran out of time when I was a junior, and we like really laid into them on that. Mm. And I felt like it just wasn't really fair because at the end of the day, like it's a competitive spirit week, but it's still like. I think that this, the floats had a lot of artistic value, yeah. and one symptom of the echo, the echo chamber that we had was that we were so invested in like being the best grade in this almost like rabid primal way that no one really stopped to think about how maybe the people who designed the senior float, the artists who worked on it, could have been offended mm. or could have been hurt by it, by yeah. like some sort of silly rivalry. Mm. A good king knows when to save his strength and when to destroy his enemies. So you agree? The Starks are enemies. Everyone who isn't us is an enemy. Cool. So the crux of this scene, I feel like, was just that, you know, Cersei is reinforcing something that uh, her son already is aware of, and that is that, um, like, you cannot be trusting anyone outside your very close inner circle, and, like, in this case, it's Lannisters, but just, like, 
it's so clear to see that um, in order to retain like this kind of illegitimate power that they have, you have to like actively go out and say like, oh, anyone who isn't a Lannister is clearly an enemy, and don't trust any information they give you. Don't you know trust in in any way possible, really. Like you don't, you're not kind to your enemies. This is you know. There's a lot of people who are going to want to remove the Lannisters from power for legitimate reasons, or just for like, uh, you know, because uh, like he's not the proper heir to the throne, or for like, legitimate reasons, just because everyone wants to get to the throne, no matter what. So. What it did to courage, and that's what we need today. The courage to make peace with men we've been killing for generations. I lost my father, my uncle, and two brothers fighting the damn crows. I'm not asking you to forget your dead. I'll never forget mine. I lost 50 brothers the night that Mance attacked the wall. But I'm asking you to think about your children now. They'll never have children of their own if we don't band together. The long night is coming. And the dead come with it. No clan can stop them. The free folk can't stop them. The Night's Watch can't stop them. And all the southern kings can't stop them. Only together. All of us. And even then it may not be enough, but at least we'll give the fuckers a fight. Vouch for this man, Torment. He's preacher than both my daughters. But he knows how to fight. He's young, but he knows how to lead. He didn't have to come to Hard Hope. He came because he needs us. And we need him. My ancestors would spit on me if I broke bread with a crow. So would mine, but fuck them, they're dead. I'll never trust a man in black. But I trust you, Torrent. If you say this is the way, we're with you. This is the way. I'm with Tormund. We stay here. We're dead men. At least with King Crow. There's a chance. Door boy. Keep that new life you want to give us. And keep your glass. As soon as you get on his ships, I'm gonna slit your throats and dunk your bodies to the bottom of the shivering sea. That's our enemy. That has always been our enemy. Okay, initial thoughts on the scene between Jon Snow and the Wildlings. Yeah, I mean, initially, it, I just was thinking of the damage that, like, echo chambers in this case, like, a clear-cut echo chamber is clearly causing. So we have, you know, the echo chamber where the Fen is unable to, like, believe or trust Jon Snow because he's been, like, kind of programmed within that echo chamber to know or to believe that Jon Snow is always going to be untrustworthy. Um, and same with the other wildling, like, she still continues to not trust Jon Snow, but Tormund's kind of like the maverick in this case. And so that um, kind of helps to turn the tides. But even then, if we had like the Then like more quickly, or like everyone kind of more quickly joining with Jon Snow, because he makes like a lot of really good points, like he has a really rousing speech about their children and all that. If we were able to like more quickly get on his side and like get on the ships and then get back um, out of Hard Home, then like we wouldn't have had the massacre of Hard Home, or maybe like we could have like exited, like let get on the ships quicker somehow. But somehow, just Jon was right essentially, and then the. Dead army like comes and kills everyone, and that's the consequence of the Fen 
um, like staying rooted inside their echo chamber that doesn't allow them to trust an outsider, which is Jon Snow. Um, That's it. It's our burn book. So we cut out girls' pictures from the yearbook, and then we wrote comments. Trang Pack is a grusky little biatch. Still true. Don Schweitzer is a fat virgin. Still half true. <laughs> Amber D'Alessio, she made out with a hot dog. Janice Ian Dyke. Who is that? I think that's that kid Damien. Yeah, he's almost too gay to function. <laughs> that's funny. Put that in there. <laughs> oh no. Maybe that was only okay when Janice said it. ...by which the plastics establish their credibility as mm -hmm. being cool and popular mm -hmm. and powerful. Mm -hmm. um, well, speaking to the power dynamic that they have in the movie, I think that one of the main things is the burn book mm. that they've got, which is, I mean, that's a pretty like direct metaphor of the power that they have, is mm. this book where they have dirt on everyone. Um, so... That's one major thing that I can think of off the top of my That's head. pretty cult-like, too, the way that they're like, and you know, these girls that they're writing about haven't done anything wrong to them. They're just, yeah. you know, oh, we're going to use this to like, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna reinforce how great we are by talking shit about everyone else. Sounds very much like an, epi uh, like, like an echo chamber. Gretchen and Karen followed me around all afternoon. So what are we doing this weekend? Yeah, what are we doing? Oh, I have to go to Madison with my parents. We have tickets for this thing. What? Was I the new queen bee? I can try and get out of it. Yeah. yeah. I learned how to control everyone around me. Hey, I'm having a small get together at my house tomorrow night. Is Regina calling? No, do you think I'm an idiot? No, it's just going to be a few cool people and you better be one of them, Biatch. Well, I don't go. Shut up. I love that shirt on you. Here we see Katie has become a part of the Plastics. She is now the, the leader of the Plastics. She has taken Regina out of her spot and is, um, has changed and shifted the dynamics of power into her own hands. She's, she has turned the other girls against Regina, which is a sign of being an echo chamber leader who turns their members against outsiders or against other people. Of toaster strudel. Would be too pleased to hear about this. Made out with a hot dog. Oh my god, that was one time! Miss Smith? Whoever wrote it probably didn't think anyone would ever see it. I hope that nobody else ever does see it. Regina George's distribution of the burn book is successful because in an epistemic bubble the one who controls the information has the power and so she controls the information in that context by disseminating the pages of the burn book. True or not, the information is the power and Regina has that power. When you get bit by a snake, you're supposed to suck the poison out. That's what I had to do. Suck all the poison out of my life. Yes, it has been difficult, especially. So here we see Katie going through the stages of performing her own epistemic, social epistemic reboot. Um, she is now apologizing and, like what she says, sucking the venom out of her life that she is put in um, by apologizing to Regina, sending her flowers, and even going to see her, joining the mathletes. Um, and trying to be involved in everything that the plastics convinced her and brainwashed her to think was bad. And she also um, becomes a better friend and starts to really appreciate the people she's had around her. So Katie even apologizes to the entire student body and um, even breaks up her crown in literal pieces and throws them to the entire, to, to students, to girls that she feels like um, deserve an uplifting um, appreciation.
for uh, how kind and beautiful and sweet they are. So she's really starting to recognize that these, this evil uh, concept and this evil echo chamber of the plastics was super problematic and she's finally getting out of it at the end of, at the end of the movie when she also you know gets the boy and her parents are okay with her of course like you know being at the school and apologizing and like making amends with the student body that she really destroyed and like hurt and that's a wrap thank you so much to all my interviewees and uh, my sister and everyone who helped me put this together um, so we've discussed echo chambers and we and epistemic bubbles and we've gone through what they are. We've asked questions about who, what they look like, if we've seen them in our day to day lives, um, what types of experiences remind us of uh, echo chambers and epistemic bubbles, and of course the the examples in Mean Girls and in Game of Thrones have been um, easy to associate with uh what when believes are informational networks that are toxic and need to be eradicated all right if you like this video give it a thumbs up and professor basu i hope you enjoyed